Good evening, everyone. We are going to talk about the life and the role of surgical care practitioners during COVID-19. And I just want to introduce Mr. Joel Dunning. is a consultant thoracic surgeon and also a renowned robotic surgeon from South Teesside Hospital, England. He is a very humble man and a savior during this COVID-19 pandemic. He has devoted himself to work as an intensive care nurse with no any egos. So, Joe, would you like to start, please? Thank you very much. So, let you know a little bit about what I did and my findings. So, 19th of March, I had totally wound down all my surgery. There was just literally nothing going on. We wound it down so we could free up beds for COVID patients, but I was had nothing to do. So, I went and saw Jim Mc. Dougal, who's a great nurse in our IT, and I just said, hey, shall I give you a hand? Let's do a shift together. So I did a 12-hour shift with him, and then I did another the day after. And then the third day, um, he said, we're a bit busy. Uh, tell you what, you take the patient next door, and I'll just keep an eye on you. And then he buggered off, and uh, he didn't help much after that. But, uh, but after that, I just joined the rotor, uh, and it was fantastic. So, so I did that for two months. Uh, you can show the next slide if you like. The first two weeks was it was getting my feet under the table, uh, and it was it went pretty well. What what my discovery was, I promised myself I would do nothing without being shown how to do it, uh, because actually it's a completely different job. It's a it's a really technical job, but it's completely different to being a surgeon. You know, you think you know uh, what an intensive care nurse does, but you absolutely don't. So I made sure every single syringe driver I drew up, drew up, I did it under supervision once. They've actually got really brilliant checking processes. So I always checked all the drugs before I gave them NG and orally. And uh, and then obviously I learned how to do all the daily checks and how to uh, turn the patients and empty the urine bottles and all that sort of thing. I, I discovered the surprise poo. So whenever you do a turn, always have your emergency poo kit ready. So I learned that the hard way on day four. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it was really good. Then, then obviously suddenly changing to PPE was, was you know, quite a different experience. Maybe next slide there. It was just a lot harder in PPE. But the, the great thing was that uh, because we had a whole flood of fantastic people coming to, into the ITU, so Richard was just saying he went back to ITU, but, but not just people that know lots about ITU. We had community nurses. We had outpatient nurses. We had nurses uh, who are in their last year as students being, you know, just suddenly uh, passed and, and sent into the front line. But we all sort of mucked in together. Everyone was really helpful and everyone sort of helped together. And that was great. And the great thing about ITU is you're just next to two other people. So if you just alternate the more junior people with the people, you know, been there a long time, you can really help each other very easily. And and really like any job, you know, 80% of it is is easy roles. And then the other 20 are slightly more complex. So Somebody like myself could, you know, do 80, 90 percent of the shift. And then I just ask some questions for the last few bits. So, yes, yeah, so it went really well. And, uh, and the great news is that we got through the peak of the uh, crisis, uh, which was Easter weekend. There was 160 patients in our hospital with coronavirus and 25 ventilated. Uh, and, uh, and now we're all the way down to 40 uh, in the hospital with only seven ventilated. So, so, so I think we got it re through it really well. The, the heroes of this pandemic are the nurses because they all were so flexible going in to look after these ventilated patients. And we just had a great experience. So next slide. Um, some lovely things came out. Our, our senior matron, uh, who's not been in the ITU for 10 years, came back to our ITU. But she also joined in Artists for the NHS. She drew this little picture uh, of me, half surgeon, half nurse sort of thing, which is quite sweet. Uh, next slide. And then, then the weirdest thing that I still don't understand is why, why on earth me going and doing some ITU shifts attracted lots of attention. This got translated into French. I did a New Zealand webcast and an Indian one. So it was quite strange that, uh, that really, you know, other doctors didn't come in. But really, the, the answer was that actually non-medics are far more flexible than those damn bloody consultants. A right bunch of uh, <laughs> stuck-up weirdos. And actually, it was people like yourselves coming into the ITU that was really gratifying. So next slide. So just in my uh, last slide, the, the, the best thing about it was the staff and everybody else. And really, 50% of them were, were senior ITU people I knew for years. But the other half were people from all over the hospital. And I think that's what got us through the pandemic so amazingly. It was the phenomenal flexibility of virtually entirely non-medical staff, people like SCPs, AMPs, outpatient nurses, all coming back to muck in. And that was just the best thing about the whole experience, really. 
So in my five minutes, I'll leave it there and I'll just go to the last slide to say thank you for those five minutes. Thank you so much, Joe. So our next speaker is Misha Nisha Nair. She is a pediatric chair for the Association of Cardiothoracic Surgical Care Practitioner and also a lead surgical care practitioner at St. Thomas Hospital, London. Nisha, the stage is yours. Thank you, Bona, and thanks for inviting me to get involved in this uh, webinar and to share my experience with COVID-19. Next slide, please. London, one of the highest city in the UK with COVID-19. We were weeks ahead of other parts of the country in terms of COVID-19 invasion and the spread of the virus. Uh, according to scientists, coronavirus is most likely to spread in cities and densely populated areas because people live closer together than in the countryside and they rely on public transport and are more likely to come close to large numbers of strangers and to touch surfaces such as handrails or door handles and that have been contaminated. So the rapid spread of the virus and uncontrollable patient admissions was overwhelming and had put severe pressure on the trusts across the capital. The pandemic had invaded the city before the time to prepare material to gather sufficient infection control advice and much less to be psychologically ready. Increasing demand for more staffs and PPs were witnessed, healthcare professionals running around hospitals, helping where they can, and with many facing lack of sleep, the mental and physical well-being was being challenged. The risk factor was having a greater concern about developing COVID-19 among the healthcare workers. I was concerned about my own health, and it was the same feeling with the rest of the colleagues and that of their families, as well as issues around training and workload. We did not feel adequately prepared for the pandemic. None of us working in healthcare will have ever experienced anything like this during our lifetimes. And trust that strategic planning to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic over the past eight weeks, I have been on a journey daily meeting people from all walks of life, from those who had never set foot in, the, in a hospital setting through to ICU. Everyone arrived with the same commitment to help as much as they could during this pandemic. To cope with this pandemic, the standard infrastructure across the trusts had changed. Areas were transformed to be able to deal with this pandemic. The plan for flow was determined. The PPs were made available. Products were exhibited in key areas. The most rapid evolving thing any of us has ever faced. Multiple training was being provided online and in-house for surge. Continuous focus was on hospital capacity. And the increasing pressure, the needs for beds, ventilators, PPs, the devastating impact of this pandemic and, of course, the de dedication, expertise and compassion of the staff in all areas were seen. Next slide, please. Redeployment experience, inadequate competency. I had a strong desire to help as much as I could with the COVID-19 crisis. Of course, this raised many personal safety issues. So many unknowns and uncertainties as we constantly heard COVID-19 case figures climbing daily from government reports. Also moving to unfamiliar surroundings was a bit stressful. Having a lower level of education brought tensions and concerns about competency. Also lacking in confidence regarding the COVID-19 infection control and prevention training that we had received. Fear and anxiety from PP. I was redeployed to an area of practice that I was not familiar with, but with, with the little skills and short training, to meet the demand from COVID-19, it was quite challenging. The thought of PP attire made me claustrophobic. The night before my shift, I had nightmares about feeling suffocated wearing PP. In spite of all these anxieties, a part of me wanted to face my fears and experience the reality for myself. However, I had an amazing support at the start of the shift and during the shift. It really was a team-focused environment. Donning and doffing of PP was initially a real challenge as it was a clear and systematic thought process to get used to it. Building resilience in different times. By my second shift, I felt much more confident when resilience is low. We may feel depressed, victimized, demoralized, hopeless, disconnected, tired, fatigued or stressed out and we might find it difficult to continue. So it was important for me to try to protect 
and reinforce resilience. And it, it is also necessary for our mental well-being in difficult times. Next slide, please. Psychological support to help us process what we have witnessed. My particular worry is the need for good staff psychological support, self-isolation and self social distancing together with the fears and anxieties at work within the family for vulnerable members and the socioeconomic situation increases our stress level. Myself and colleagues from other countries who will not be able to get to see family members and will feel particularly isolated. The stopping of international travel and border closures was obviously compounding this. I imagine as we work through this pandemic, a lot of us may need various forms of psychological support. Next slide, please. This experience has reminded me of the incredible resilience, compassion, and can-do attitude of our profession. Our patients need us more now more than ever, and I'm proud to be able to support them and my fellow healthcare workers during this pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much for Thank your you. talk. So our next speaker is Mr. Richard Thompson, who is our National Educational Chair for the Association of Kodathorasic Surgical Care Practitioner and also a Surgical Care Practitioner at Hull University Teaching Hospital. Richard is one of the great teacher and also he is a very, very hard working man I never ever know in my life. Richard, please. Well, Vana, thanks for your compliment. I'm not sure it's justified, but yeah, so um, thank you very much for asking me to speak. I'm going to speak on uh, my experience of intensive care unit nursing and family life during the pandemic for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So prior to COVID-19, I, I had a, a reasonable career going on. I was a SCP in cardiothoracic, a clinical specialist for many for a couple of companies, I would do locum SCP, education chair, as Ravana says, for the ACT SCP, and an examiner for the Royal College of Surgeons. So I was a pretty busy guy. And then, uh, next slide, please. And then coronavirus kind of all changed that. So uh, obviously, Nisha had the initial um, surge in, in London. We didn't have that exactly. So we, we kind of had time. We heard about COVID-19, but we didn't really have that many patients to start with. And being in Hull, geographically, we were way out, way out on a limb. So we were expecting to reach a peak, according to our workforce people, about two weeks after that. In the end, I think it's probably more likely four weeks afterward we peaked. So it gave us a bit of time. We had uh, teaching on O2 therapy to the, that they asked me to do to start with. So I, and I could not believe how many staff were returning. There was research nurses coming back. There was nurses that were non-registered anymore that were coming back for the teaching sessions. We had room full of maybe 40 or 50 nurses that we were teaching all about the new practices for BTS guidelines for O2 therapy. And we were talking about donning and doffing and all that. And then we needed to uh, change that slightly because we had to obviously um, maintain our two metres distance. So, And then I updated my profile on the Trust Internet site and about 30 minutes later, I was informed that I'd be going to intensive care as a nurse for the foreseeable future. I have a background in nursing on intensive care. I did nursing for many years on ICU. And for those of you who know, I did uh, critical care outreach as well. So I went out to see the patients in different areas of the hospital. But they decided that it was best for me to go back as nurse in intensive care because they were very, very short. We had nurses that were... Um, isolating due to COVID-19 symptoms. We had nurses that were shielding because of comorbidities. And unfortunately, there was a large amount of nurses in Hull that were pregnant at the time. So the trusts were really desperate for intensive care nurses. We were setting up intensive cares everywhere. So we, we, we initially start with four intensive cares in Hull, and that's gone up to five at the moment. But we had a potential to go up to six seven and, and then start using theatres after that. Next slide, please. So my journey to the intensive care unit, I was really concerned. Obviously, I was apprehensive, not only about the fact that COVID-19 and the concerns I would have for the family of coming back off shift dealing with COVID-19 patients, but there was other things as well. There was a sense of, I had a sense of duty that I should be going there because I had experience in critical care. But there was also the element that I was very concerned that, can I still do it? And we had a tier system. So we still have that tier system in place at the moment because we don't have enough ICU nurses to look after all the patients at present. So what happens is 
The tier one nurse is an experienced critical care nurse. And then we have tier two, which is now, they are now becoming experienced critical care nurses because we're now about eight weeks into intensive care now. Um, and then we have tier three, which are the support staff. So they are doing things like emptying the catheters, help you roll, that type of thing. And they decided to make me tier one. So if the pandemic had hit Hull very hard, which I don't think it has hit as hard, potentially some other places, I could have potentially been looking after four patients with the support of other nurses. Now that did start, start scaring me, especially seeing as I looked at a couple of ventilators and think, I never seen these things before. However, there's no, like Joel said, there's certain things that are always the same on intensive care. You always roll patients. You always find a poo when you roll them. You always do mouth care. You always do eye care. And when I finally got in, into intensive care, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. However, the walking onto the first shift in the COVID-19 in intensive care was a surreal world in itself. I never witnessed anything like that. I, I'd been in the Territorial Army and I'd put nuclear biochemical warfare kit on. And it felt a bit like that. You know, we all donned at the start of the shift and we walked in and the music was loud because there was no awake patients. They were all ventilated. And at that time in intensive care, the plan was, particularly in Hull, I'm sure it was the same everywhere else, that we were going to ventilate everybody. So we tube pretty much every patient. Now, I know the, the, the management of COVID-19 has changed, but I did have a lot of family support at this time. But I did have some real concerns about passing the virus onto my family. Subsequently, which meant that I haven't passed it on to the family, fingers crossed. Next slide, please. So I'm nine weeks into intensive care and a nice haircut by the sterile services guy uh, at the end of a night shift was very welcomed. I've worked on all the five intensive cares. Lots of shifts have been like a reunion because there's old staff that I've no, I haven't seen for years and years and years, particularly at Hall Royal. The team working is absolutely a, has been amazing. We've had operating department practitioners and sterile services that I'd like to highlight particularly because the sterile services, they've been out there, they treat you like a blooming rock star. You come out, you pass them your PPE, they say, go get a cup of tea, go sort yourselves out, I'll clean all your gear ready for you going back in. I have, however, forgotten how loud nursing is and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was absolutely knackered at the end of the 13 hours every time I finished. But my wife being my wife has been very, very supportive. She made she put a bag on the outside of the back door and then I took all my clothes off when I got home ready for the shower. Next slide, please. Family life is kind of different in COVID-19. Because I'm back on shift work, it actually has given me more time to spend with the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah so we've managed to get out cycling, yeah, even when I haven't fallen asleep on the sofa. We've got a puppy, yeah, which we're looking after and my daughter's taking charge of. One thing that has been kind of weird is that I've come home and because, I guess because it's a reasonably small community in Hull, what we found is that the Facebook updates we've seen about the patients that my wife has seen about the patient I've been looking after that day, which is really weird. So I've come home and my wife goes, oh, how was such and such doing? I say, well, you probably know better than me. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Richard, for your nice talk. Thank you. Let's move on to the next speaker. This is Miss Jenny Palima, and she is our National Holiday Secretary, and she is the most cute and nice person in the world. Oh, she is always there. Whenever, whatever you ask her, she is there, and she will do at any time. And she is going to talk about her experiences in Wolverhampton Hospital, England, UK. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, thank you very much, Ivana. Um, I don't think I'm that cute, but yeah, thanks anyway. So I'm Jenny. I'm one of the cardiothoracic surgical care practitioners in New Cross Heart and Lung Centre, and I've been there for about four years. Now, unlike the other speakers, and probably some of you too, um, who have been redeployed to high-risk environments, such as intensive care units or wards with confirmed or um, suspected COVID-19 patients, I've been redeployed away from these high-risk areas due to ill health. So now I am currently part of the COVID-19 hotline team in the Occupational Health Department. Next slide, please. So what do I do normally and what do I do now? Um, much like most cardiothoracic SCPs here, my usual role involves conduit harvesting I'm assisting in theatre, seeing patients in the ward and, and a bit of exposure in clinic. My role within the COVID-19 hotline team, however, couldn't be more different. 
there's definitely no scalpel or forceps. It's a non-patient facing role. Um, so I'm either working in the office, social distancing from my colleagues, of course, or working from home. Um, my role entails um, following strict guidelines and, and ever-changing guidelines, hence the picture says it all, really. I, I look like that girl um, in the photo sometimes when trying to find the right answer to, uh, to a query. Our team provides advice to members of staff in all matters um, COVID-19 related, um, but within the realms of occupational health only. So, for instance, I would give advice on actions to be taken if a staff or a member of the household exhibits um, symptoms of coronavirus. I would also advise on actions that need to be taken for staff who, who fall under um, low, medium or high risk categories and, and we would book staff and, and the, a member of their household for um, COVID testing as well and so on. Next slide please. What I wish I do now aside from being theatre and, and what I actually do. Now I'm sure we all feel the same way as soon as coronavirus um, reached the UK. Um, I felt like I needed to be out there and that I, I need to help out on the front line. I was preparing myself for it, actually, because I, like, like Richard, I've had um, ICU experience, so I thought um, I might be redeployed there for when the time came. So I've even gone and dug out and reviewed my notes from when I used to work in ICU. Um, however, following um, a risk assessment with occupational health, unfortunately, I was ruled out of working in high-risk environments such as theatres and, and ICU well, at least for the time being anyway. So here I am in my not so heroic role, um, but uh, it's my different kind of frontline. Um, having said that, I found working with the hotline team um, very interesting indeed. It's, it's, it's not as morbid and extreme, which is more me, but it is rewarding in its own way, especially being able to guide staff in the right direction in these unprecedented times. Next slide, please. So positive things about being part of the COVID-19 hotline team. Whilst the thought of being redeployed is quite nerve-wracking, um, the occupational health team have been really friendly and supportive and, and they have made me feel like a valued member of the team, even in a short, short space of time. Uh, there's meeting new people as well. Everyone in the hotline team um, feels the same in that we all um, have met really lovely people who we wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with if it wasn't for our redeployment. There's team spirit and camaraderie. Uh, I feel like this crisis has, has really unified NHS staff. Um, everyone has the mentality of, you know, uh, we are all in this together. And even though there are really tough times, I've noticed everyone um, do try to keep morale up however possible, really. Um, Developing new skills. Um, with, with this new role, I've, I've, I've had to adapt very quickly to different, um, to different tasks. So, for example, as an SCP, we deal with patients who are intubated and, and ventilated. Um, one can say, I guess, uh, that the need for long conversation in, in, in that role is, minimal, is minimal in some ways. Um, whereas in my new role, um, the main part of the job is talking. My phone rings constantly and, and I have hundreds of questions thrown at me when I'm working. It's definitely pushed me out of, of my comfort zone and I'm quite an introvert anyway and I don't think I've, I've ever talked so much in my career um, really so it certainly made me more confident though and, and, and I'm exercising muscles that I, I never needed to use them um, so much and so I think overall it will make me a better um, practitioner as, as I would be more well-rounded I mean apart from the fact that of course I've just been eating too much chocolate in lockdown you know well-rounded. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and finally, um, despite working um, in a non-patient facing role, I, I still feel like I'm doing my part. Uh, I still feel that great sense of um, satisfaction that I'm able to help um, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and like I said, uh, in my different kind of, um, of front line. Next slide, please. The so, uh, so-called um, negatives of my re redeployment. Like the other speakers, I guess uh, the, the unknown, that's the scariest thing for, for everyone involved in this unprecedented um, situation, you know, um, being thrown into a new environment and, and having to adapt and, and ensure um, I'm doing things right. I mean, some of uh, the phone calls that we get are quite straightforward and some, there's no simple answer. And sometimes you feel really 
you, you feel very silly and, and out of your depth. And since the start of this pandemic, evidence and guidance from the government has been changing constantly, really. And being part of the hotline team, um, we can bear the point if, if a member of staff does not like uh, what they hear and when we advise. However, though, uh, you will always have other staff around that can help. So, like this hotline team, um, for instance, it consists of staff from different specialities, from intensive care, general surgery, cardiac, and so on. So there's a great skill mix and very experienced people in the group, um, and everyone has something to add to the team. Um, so in a way, it, it makes the unknown a little bit easier to, to deal with, because you're never, you're, you're never on your own as such, really. And then like working in an acute setting as well, at least I can tell the staff, on the other hand, you to either wait or, or, or that I'll bring them back. Um, another negative, I'd say, is, is just you, you get this sense of guilt. You know, I, I often ask myself, uh, is, is the clap for NHS frontline workers for me as well? Some of my colleagues in the hotline team were talking about this. And, you know, we have families and, and friends sending us thank you messages for being an NHS worker. Um, and doing our bit um, during this um, difficult times. Uh, and, and yet, in a way, you feel immensely guilty because you're not really seeing patients at the moment. You, you don't feel like a frontline worker. Uh, and the, the reality is, is you have been removed, I, I am anyway, I've been removed from, from the um, front line to avoid um, exposure to potential COVID-19 positive patients. So I suppose those are some of the thoughts you do grapple with. Um, a word for my colleagues as well. I have colleagues and friends who are, are still working in theatre and intensive care, um, and you really can't help but worry, um, which is only natural, I guess. Um, and the last one is, is, is that I am missing my job and, and my colleagues. I'm looking forward to, to things going back to normal. I do miss my work team. Um, and, you know, once you work with a core team um, for a while, especially if you get along with them, um, you become quite a close unit. So I certainly miss being part of them and, and you know, being an SCP all together. But I guess at the end of the day, uh, the most important thing is not my needs. It's doing whatever helps the NHS and, and the country to get through this. And, and that's it for me, really. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Mr. Teddy O'Connor. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to talk. Next slide, please. Um, Obviously, I don't want this to be a bit of a rant, but uh, it may come across as a rant. But, uh, I apologize for that in advance. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, in, in order to clarify my background, I just wanted to go over my, my professional history. So I, I've been working at St. Thomas's Hospital for 23 years, and I trained in theatres mainly. That's my background. So I've done uh, scrub and anesthetics. And... Uh, I got to a point I became charge nurse in vascular theatres and then um, I got to a point where I decided that I needed to take a change. So I decided to apply for SCP role um, and I started as an SCP in 2002. So today I've, I've been doing this role for nearly 20 years. When I left St. Thomas's, I went to the Hammersmith. I spent two years there. I finished my degree and I did my prescribing course. Uh, after that, I was desperate to do um, endoscopic vein harvesting, so I moved to St. George's and I've been there since uh, for nearly five years now. In my present role at St. George's, my management structure is under one of the consultants and one of the assistant managers. Uh, my shift patterns are eight to six and I do four days a week. The days leading up to the lockdown, I was basically sent home and said, you have to work from home and be on call. Um, and if an emergency case comes in, we'll call you in. So this went on for about two weeks. And every week I was appearing on the rotor. And then one day the rotor came out and I wasn't on the rotor. So I spoke to the consultant, uh, organizing consultant, and he said, uh, oh, don't worry, you'll still be paid, but just be available if we need you. So then one day I was at home and I got a telephone call from the from the head of nursing. And they said to me, well, you can't stay at home. You are a nurse. You have to come in and work. So I said, well, you know, I'm not staying at home through my own choice. I've been told to stay at home and be on call. They said, no, 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 you've got to come in. 
Uh, Could I have the next slide, please? So she said, you have to come in, and there's an ITU training day starting tomorrow. So I said, fine, uh, I'll come in. That's fine. So I phoned my so-called line manager and said, are you happy with me doing this? And they said, yes, just make sure you wear a mask and gloves. Thanks for your support. So I went to the training day, and that was quite interesting. They taught us quite a lot about, you know, uh, adjusting ventilators, uh, recording all the vital signs. Um, and it was actually quite a, quite a good, interesting day. Came a lot, uh, came away le having learnt a lot. Um, the second day, they said you can go on an orientation day to the general uh, ITU. So I went to that. And most of the nurses that were working there were nurses that didn't want to work with COVID patients. So they were all being guarded, if you like. Um, and so, uh, but, but they, they offered me quite a lot of information and I learned a lot from them as well. So the, you know, working with COVID patients, um, you know, basically uh, you have to adopt a, a, a work life pattern, which is completely different from what you're, you're used to. So basically, I had to explain to my my partner and my daughter, saying that you know when I come home from work, things are going to be very different. Can I have the next slide, please. So basically, in order to go to work, I needed to take a plastic bag for my clothes to go in, plastic bag for my phone, plastic bag for my ID card, and then when I came in, all my clothes were taken off at the door. I had to go for a shower, and everything was entering the war zone, as Richard said earlier. You go in and it's just nothing that you would expect. You go in, you have to put your mask on, uh, put your visor, all your protective gear. There are staff absolutely everywhere. So I went in and they allocated me to patients. I was caring for patients on ventilators. And in the bay, there would be one qualified ITU nurse. And if you had any queries or anything like that, they would, they would come and assist you. But basically, you were looking after that patient. You were doing all the recall, uh, uh, patient monitoring, uh, giving all their drugs, turning them, giving them suctioning, everything. You were doing everything. The change of shift pattern was um, I was doing eight to four as an SCP, but this was doing long 12-hour shifts starting at half past seven in the morning till eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, weekends and nights. So it's something I haven't done for a very, very long time. Obviously, one of the patients that I was looking for, looking after, who, who I got quite attached to, if you like, his condition deteriorated, and while I was on shift, he died, and it was no, really, no, no, no. Really, really, really sad. It was one of the hardest things ever. Everyone in the ITU obviously are trying their best, and I've made quite a lot of good contacts and friends while I'm there. So basically, my fears before, during, and after the shifts is have I got it? I'm obviously of the age group um, where, you know, uh, the statistics show that I'm most vulnerable in catching this disease. I was actually thrown into the deep end, not through my choice. Next slide, please. Cardiac team, I, was, I felt very let down and left out. I had no, I felt like I had no support from any of the surgeons because now I was under the nursing team and I had to sink or swim. I basically put myself into a bubble and just went and did what I had to do, came home. My surgical colleagues, the SHOs, I was told when I was put into this position that all the doctors' registrars would be uh, redeployed. But, but to this point, I've never seen any of them on the COVID wards. All the SHOs have been dispersed, but you don't see any of them with the COVID patients. The registrars are still on their rotor, providing emergency cardiac surgery. But we're not taking cardiac patients. We're not doing cardiac surgery. So I don't really understand why they're still on producing a rotor for cardiac surgery when we're not doing cardiac surgery. And, there, and this was how it was sold to me. The scrub, the scrub team providing cardiac surgery, again, there's no cardiac surgery. So I'm not quite sure what they were doing. And the perfusionist weren't in COVID as well. So I kind of feel like I've taken the brunt of this. I've been the one that, in terms, from the cardiac team anyway, I've been the one that's been pushed into it the most. So I apologise in advance, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Teddy. Have you finished? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much.
that is the next webinar we have on thoracic surgery during COVID. And it's going to be on Friday, the 12th of June, 2020, for one and a half hours.